Well, right now we are looking at the endocrine system. And I'm going to be quite specific within this particular tutorial because I'm going to avoid talking about the reproductive hormones. I want to save that for a, a different tutorial. So we're going to come back to estrogen and testosterone and some others uh, in a future tutorial. But what I want to do in this particular session is I want to make sure we understand the global concept of the endocrine system and look at how some specific hormones are actually part of our sport exercise and health considerations. So first of all, I just want to define for you what we mean by the term hormone. First of all, we can, we can describe it as what's called a mediator molecule okay a mediator molecule what do we actually mean by this sort of concept well first of all it is released by glands okay so we're going to come to the glands in a second it's released by glands and then what this is going to do is it's going to regulate activity somewhere else regulate activity somewhere else so that is why it is a mediator somewhere else it is released in one place, a gland, but it regulates the activity of, in essence, a different place. And we'll look at examples of that in a moment. But the other things I want you to be aware of with regard to hormones as well is that they are protein structures. And of course, that might sort of link you back to your GCSEs and thinking back to um, sort of the studies you've done of ribosomes, these organelles microscopically structured in each cell, da 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 da. They are protein structures, and we want you to be aware of that. And they are, as I've mentioned already, released by glands. Now, with that in mind, let's actually have a look at some actual examples here. I want to introduce you to one particular hormone, and we are going to refer to it as epinephrine. Okay, epinephrine. But you might know it by its other name, which is adrenaline. Adrenaline. There we go, just about to squeeze that in. And not surprisingly, adrenaline, epinephrine, is released by the adrenal gland, which you can see here sits just above the kidney. Now, what is the role of this adrenal? Um, <laughs> nearly molded those two words together. What is the role of epinephrine here? Well, first of all, in its sort of most general sense, it is part of our flight or, f or fight mechanism. Okay, and I'm going to come back to sort of the exercise conditions of this. As we know already, it's released by the adrenal gland, and this is the impact. It up arrow increases metabolism so our combined chemical activity of the body will increase this includes an increase in heart rate an increase in f which we're going to is the symbol for breathing frequency how rapidly we breathe and it also changes blood sugar and it also changes blood pressure Okay, so blood sugar levels, we're going to come back to that in a different tutorial, but also blood pressure. So the release of this epinephrine, adrenaline, from the adrenal gland is effectively a readying hormone. If we were to consider this to be a readying, readying hormone, that's actually quite interesting to us from the perspective, certainly of performance in sport and exercise for that matter as well. Because, for example, if we actually look, if I just, get, if I just scroll down, if I just do the most basic sketch of a uh, heart rate response graph. Now, I'm not gonna put any values or anything in here, but if we start exercise, so ima imagine the exercise starts here, for example, and it ends over here, whatever that happens to be. This is my resting heart rate. Let's, let's make that 70 beats per minute. So we've got heart rate and beats per minute there. Let's make that 70 beats per minute. But notice that before exercise begins, heart rate increases. Okay, that is, this is the start of maybe our training run or whatever, but our heart rate has gone up at this point in time here, whatever that is. And this thing, and obviously our heart rate would continue to go up and it would level off and it would drop and level out after exercise. But notice that we've got this bunch of heart rates here, I've made too many of them, this bunch of heart rates here, okay, that have happened before the exercise started. Why? And that is because we have the release of epinephrine, okay? We have this readying hormone, and we actually call this, by the way, the anticipatory rise. The anticipatory rise. And you might notice this on whenever you do sort of cardiac values and things. You'll notice this happens before exercise. And of course, it continues to rise afterwards, but that's because exercise conditions take place. Before then, before the start, that's an adrenal impact. It's released by the adrenal gland, 
And you might actually remember from some of our other tutorials, it acts directly on the sine of atrial node, and it is a uh, and it stimulates the increased heart rate in that sense. Now, we are going to still focus on the adrenal gland here, and I'm now going to take our epinephrine, and I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to say, what about norepinephrine? Okay, norepinephrine. <laughs> Now, I've written that very neatly, I apologize. This is also called noradrenaline, by the way. And what this does, you can almost think of it like the opposite impact of epinephrine and adrenaline, but what it does is it regulates and controls arousal. So it regulates arousal. In other words, it has more of a calming effect. It regulates what we call attentional focus. Now, we're gonna to come to Nidifer's model of attentional focus in our psychology course but it regulates how what it is we're concentrating on or how wide our concentration or how narrow whether we concentrate inwardly or outwardly that's the nidifer model you'll come to that on another occasion but also it helps to regulate the stress response i, sh I should have <laughs> just done my little copy there stress response now this is an interesting point because I was sort of making out earlier that epinephrine adrenaline is actually really positive. For exercise and sport, it sort of gets this anticipatory rise. But the other thing to notice about epinephrine is if we are stressed or we're worried about something, for example, our body will release epinephrine as a response to that. And that can actually, over time, be quite damaging. And that is why stress is not good for us, in essence. So as a result of that, norepinephrine is that more calming, bringing us back down, regulation, and that's the role of that uh, particular um, hormone oh by the way another one is it's really good for cognitive function if you've noticed that when you're kind of adrenalized um, you might not necessarily think clearly well norepinephrine noradrenaline has the opposite impact it makes you more sort of cognitive and cognizant if I can put it in those particular t uh, terms now I want to go to to further um, hormones I'm now going to focus you in on the pancreas very representative pancreas we've got <laughs> got here it's not <coughs> quite as horizontal as that um, but I want to introduce you to both glucagon glucagon and insulin both of which are released by the pancreas and I want to just scr uh, scroll down and I'll just go all the way to the bottom and I'll give you some details so insulin to begin with folks okay now you've probably come across insulin before because you're aware it's um, it's a hormone which is either underproduced or not produced in conditions like type 1 diabetes and so on but what we're going to do here is just look at its function it's released by the pancreas it's part of our digestive system you know the pancreatic fluid passed down the pancreatic duct into you probably remember from biology into these um, small intestine of the duodenum but ne don't worry about that for today what we want to know is what does this actually do well here's factor number one it helps or aids or facilitates any of those words are fine it helps glucose enter cells now what that means in reality is that this means that therefore blood sugar levels blood glucose levels will decrease because insulin facilitates the movement of that glucose into cells for respiration of course so therefore blood sugar falls it also, and I really like this point, it also, it signals the liver. What do we mean, signals the liver? It signals the liver to store, to store glucose. So if we have got too much glucose in the blood, the uh, insulin will trigger the liver to store that glucose. And it stores it, by the way, in the form of glycogen. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. And finally, finally, when levels in the bloodstream decrease, so so if we get in the bloodstream, if you, if we get decreasing levels, <coughs> if we get decreasing levels in the blood, this will trigger a decrease. And the, uh, that's by the way of glucose, I should say. If we get decreasing levels, this will trigger a decrease in insulin production. So if our blood sugar levels full insulin production delivery to the duodenum this morning testing that will decrease now i mentioned glucagon to you earlier again um, secreted by the pancreas and th think about this sort of greatly as the opposite really of um, insulin in lots of ways um, so it's released by the pancreas again and secreted we really should say and it does it in the following conditions it does it when we have got low blood sugar so we mentioned before when blood sugar drops 
this will mean that insulin is no longer secreted in the same quantities, but we will secrete glucagon. So imagine this is, for example, this could be, for example, when you're in the 45th minute of a hockey match, for example, your blood sugar level's low, maybe you haven't taken an energy drink, maybe you haven't taken an energy gel, whatever, your blood sugar levels drop. So what does this do? It stimulates, okay? And it stimulates the liver, okay? And in this time, it stimulates the liver not to store glycogen, but to, uh, to glucose, but to release glucose. And it asks the liver, not literally, but it asks the liver to release glucose from glycogen. And this is called, and it's a word I always struggle with, glyco, <laughs> glyco. I'm even nervous just saying it. I trip over this word constantly, journolysis, glycogenolysis. And this is taking glycogen from the liver, glycogen, and converting it back to glucose, which can then go into the blood and then ultimately be delivered to the cells for aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And that is the purpose of glucagon. So start to consider that glucagon is really important for stimulating the breakdown of uh, glycogen and stored glucose from the liver. And of course, therefore, for longer duration activities, we're going to do this. Whereas our insulin is helping it effectively to get that glucose out of the bloodstream if it's in high quantities, get it into the cells for utilization, or is getting it into the liver for storage. That's what it does.